I've been asked, as Amy has just explained, I've been asked to speak a little on U.S.-China relations um, and what we might expect uh, going forward, um, especially given the fact that we have a new administration in office um, uh, and raising all sorts of questions about the future of China policy as well as Asia policy. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is the following. Uh, the first is to start with President Trump um, and to start with President Trump as a way to give some context um, uh, as to his election, uh, as a way to think about the significance, uh, for example, of his suggested directions uh, in China policy. Uh, two, to give attention to some of the ways that the conditions of U.S.-China relations uh, have shifted. Um, we can think about this geopolitically in terms of power dynamics, we can also think about this uh, domestically um, and how those changing conditions, geopolitical and domestic, might affect how the U.S. conceives and approaches China and, of course, also vice versa. Um, and, and how those changes in geopolitical and domestic conditions also might complicate an already very complex uh, relationship. And then third, I'd also like to consider uh, the U.S.-China relationship as also more than a bilateral relationship. Uh, after all, uh, there are very few relationships today um, that can properly be understood or managed um, as purely bilateral relationships. Um, and specifically here, it may be useful then to consider the U.S.-China relationship in the context of East and Southeast Asia. Uh, East and Southeast Asia were the various dynamics of U.S.-China relations are playing out most prominently. So let me start uh, with the election of President Trump. The start of a new administration uh, typically is associated with uncertainty, um, especially about U.S.-China policy. Um, and in this sense, this is par for the course. Okay? Um, it's typical for incoming presidents, uh, especially if they're coming from a different party from their predecessor, to distinguish themselves from, their, from those that came before them. Um, and that can inject, of course, questions on a whole host of issues, uh, and certainly injects a whole host of questions about China and how we would approach China. China policy in particular has often been a prominent area of distinction in terms of presidential candidates running for office. Um, it's not uncommon, for example, for new presidents uh, to come in having proclaimed new policies and new stances on such issues as human rights in China, Taiwan status, uh, or how we might uh, support Taiwan, and also increasingly trade issues. Um, uh, being tough on China, or I can be tougher than you, uh, has become a common and regular campaign uh, practice and platform of various candidates through the years. On the other hand, it's also been typical to see U.S.-China policy after an initial period of flux, uncertainty, and adjustment uh, to revert back to also more moderate positions. Uh, that are frequently more in line actually with their predecessors that had just left office. Um, and this is because incoming presidents, uh, typically at least, typically at least, <laughs> soon discover that the U.S.-China relationship is too complex, uh, too interdependent, uh, with too many other issues and interests to hold the relationship hostage for too long um, uh, to, uh, or to any one issue. Um, in this sense, uh, U.S.-China relations has also displayed a degree of predictability in elections uh, and transitions past. Um, some characterize it, in fact, historians who have looked at the dynamics and trajectories of U.S.-China relations have described an oscillating pattern, in fact, that is partly reflective of U.S. electoral cycles. Um, some of you may have also heard um, uh, an interview um, from former President George W. Bush who basically commented on these very dynamics um, where you come into office having certain expectations uh, and certainly pressures from your constituencies but soon find that in fact you need to moderate some of those original positions. Now it's early still as we know um, but we do see some of the same pattern, um, also characterizing Donald Trump, 
uh, the last six days, for anyone who's been paying attention, the last six days appear to have brought some notable reversals on a whole host of defining issues uh, on Russia, Syria, North Korea, China, and most recently, NATO. <laughs> Um, uh, as, as regards China policy in particular, we also see some notable adjustments, uh, certainly in the last uh, week, um, especially given the fact that he's just met, of course, uh, pre uh, the president of China, uh, President Xi Jinping. Um, and if we think about what he said on the campaign trail, he said many things, uh, as you're aware. Um, on the campaign trail, he sought to distinguish himself, of course, from other candidates. And of course, he especially would seek to distinguish himself from Hillary Clinton, and of course, then by extension, President Obama, since Hillary Clinton had served as a Secretary of State during his first term. And Hillary Clinton was, in fact, a key architect, uh, in particular, of US, China, and US, Asia policy. Um, uh, and so, uh, and, and indeed, um, uh, China policy has become very much equated with Asia policy these days. Um, now, so President Trump on the campaign trail, uh, as candidates do, sought to distinguish himself then from other candidates also running uh, for office. Um, now, the Obama administration itself, um, it should be noted, had a difficult and increasingly tense relationship uh, with China. Um, but then candidate Trump's criticisms on, chi on China on the campaign trail was nevertheless still uh, quite dramatic <laughs> and maybe more extreme than most. Um, he characterized, uh, in one notable criticism, he characterized climate change as a Chinese hoax uh, designed to undermine the American economy. Uh, he charged China with currency manipulation. Uh, he also threatened to impose, of course, a 45% uh, tariff on Chinese goods. Since taking office, however, he appears to have moderated, um, or at least put aside for now, um, some of the more damaging uh, threats and charges. Uh, for example, he appears to have backed away from charges of currency manipulation, which most economists actually agree is no longer true since 2014. Um, uh, similarly, the threat of a 45% tariff, which many uh, uh, warned would set off a trade war, also appears to have been put aside uh, for the time being. Um, though President Trump also uh, reiterates uh, that he remains committed to retaliating against China should our trade imbalance not be alleviated. Um, and so he reserves the right to, of course, draw on other tools, including some of the ones that he's professed uh, previously. Um, uh, still, it seems that he has moderated on um, key economic claims for now. And some of the tools that he's thinking about um, are also in line with some that the Obama administration also uh, uh, considered and pursued. So there's some normalcy in, in that sense for now. Um, perhaps most notably, uh, there appears to be some moderation on early statements on Taiwan. Now, as I mentioned, Taiwan has frequently uh, historically been an issue of difference uh, between administrations. Uh, Taiwan is a recurring issue in terms of presidential cycles. I'm trying to pay attention to this thing. Um, uh, in December of last year, the administration appeared to signal a major historic policy uh, change on Taiwan, um, uh, especially as regards the status of Taiwan. Um, and so as some of you may be aware, um, Beijing considers this is Okay. Uh, uh, Beijing considers uh, uh, Taiwan to be a renegade province. Um, and since 1972, as a condition of the normalization of relations between the United States and, chi and, and China, U.S.-China relations have been premised um, on a one-China policy, uh, where the U.S. recognizes that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. Uh, and Beijing agrees uh, to remain committed to the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue. Um, again, since the 1970s, this has formed an important foundation um, and starting point in terms of U.S.-China relations. Now, that is the consensus, in fact, that has underpinned the diplomatic relationship for more than four decades. 
As part of that policy, U.S. presidents, um, as part of that policy, U.S. presidents have then been very careful uh, to avoid direct contact with Taiwan's leaders by person, for example, or by phone. And even at the same time, we do maintain uh, actually extensive relations um, that are economic, they are military, as well as other exchanges uh, with Taiwan. Um, so in any case, this has been long-standing practice and foundation of U.S.-China policies. Um, the long-standing policy and practice of U.S.-China relations was challenged when uh, President-elect Trump uh, uh, accepted a congratulatory phone call from, President of Taiwan, uh, from the President of Taiwan back in December. Um, that call, which Taiwan coordinated with the Trump team, has been characterized as historic and unprecedented. Uh, President-elect Trump defending the phone call uh, and true to what many characterize and what many have characterized as his transactional approach to foreign relations argued, quote, I don't know why we have to be bound by a one China policy unless of course we can make a deal. Unless of course we can make a deal with China having to do with other things. He also linked of course the Taiwan issue specifically to the North Korea issue saying that if Beijing did not do more to curb North Korea, the U.S. would no longer abide by the One China policy, thus, if he were to do so, again, abandoning for decades in terms of the foundations of U.S.-China relations. Um, yet, as with past incoming presidents, we've also seen some walking back from those original positions, um, original stances and original defense. In, in a February phone call with, pre, with the president of China, Xi Jinping, President Trump stated that he had agreed to, quote, honor the one China, uh, our one China policy. Of course, it's early. Uh, we haven't made it through the first 100 days yet, uh, even. Uh, and as one China observer points out, President Trump has yet to refer to the actual content of what the one China policy is. Um, and so, and hopefully he knows it now, um, but that does leave the door open uh, to interpretations that may still be different um, from, from what has been practiced in the past. Meanwhile, as I'm sure you're also aware, many see President Trump as being a very different kind of president from those past. Um, and so these, these regularities or these patterns may very well prove not to be true. Um, we've seen, for example, that this is a president that is more willing than others, in rhetoric at very least, to defy both convention and past policy. And so there's no doubt that much still remains unknown as we go forward. But there are some things that we do know, right? And what we do know is that President Trump assumes office at a time of great change and great transition in both U.S.-China relations uh, in East Asia and the U.S. role in both Asia and the world. And so as much as we may also focus on the idiosyncrasies of President Trump, the uncertainties of current U.S.-China policy may also be a reflection of the moment that we find ourselves in. For a while now, the ground on which U.S.-China relations um, uh, have been, uh, that U.S.-China relations has been based has been shifting. Um, uh, and these are, not all, these are not all new developments, um, rather many of them have been in train for a while, um, but they are shifting the ground on which U.S.-China policy has been based uh, for the last few decades. Uh, geopolitical changes over the course of the 1980s, intensified in the 1990s, have heightened questions about strategic purpose. Uh, what is this U.S.-China relationship about? Um, what, is, uh, what should be U.S. interests when dealing with China or with, when dealing with Asia? The Cold War is over, right? And the loss of that strategic rationale and the loss of that conceptual framework has made for a much more complicated U.S.-China relationship in the 21st century. Um, it has also made for a much more complex domestic uh, decision-making environment in both countries. Uh, by this view, the instabilities of U.S.-China policies uh, that we've seen may also be reflections of a general lack of clarity about what U.S. interests ought to be when it comes to both China and, uh, of course, by extension, also uh, what our interests and role ought to be in East and Southeast Asia. 
Most recently, questions about US-China policy are additionally underscored by the fact that US power, influence, and commitments are not what they used to be. Right? This is what people talk about, changes in power and changes in plenty. So changes in power and plenty, which affects how we approach a variety of relationships in the world. While this trend line, again, is not new, um, it has been years and even decades in the making, President Trump's transactional approach has certainly made it more explicit. And this is nowhere more apparent than in President Trump's blunt and explicit warnings to allies and partners that U.S. commitments are conditional, and that if those conditions aren't met, other states should begin to search for their own solutions. I might say here that in so doing, the U.S. projects a contrary mix, right? In expressing such views, the U.S. projects a contrary mix of heightened insecurity as to U.S. capacities to maintain old commitments and to pursue business as usual, but also more than a little complacency and overconfidence as to the strength of our own attractions, as well as our partners' commitments to the U.S. relationship. And of course, questions of power and plenty are also relative questions. And China's economic and military growth have also been growing. There's a lot of questions about China's growth, and, and that bears underscoring. There's lots of questions about China's growth. That, uh, there are questions about how much growth, in what areas, uh, uh, how, how sustainable it is. There are many questions about China's growth. But there's also little question that China's capacities and influence have grown. Um, and, there's, and, and U.S. anxieties and insecurities have heightened as a result. In fact, alongside um, uh, I, that, that fact, alongside U.S. economic anxieties, has, has made, um, uh, made another concern sharpen uh, over the years, over the last 10 years especially. And that is the concern that rivalry and competition, which increasingly have become defining features of the U.S.-China relationship, um, uh, ha uh, have become prominent themes uh, in the conduct of U.S.-China policy. Again, this isn't new. Perceptions of rivalry and strategic competition were already evident in the administration of George W. Bush, who rejected characterizations of strategic partnership in favor of explicit characterizations of China as a strategic competitor. It was also certainly evident in the Obama administration's approach to China, notwithstanding their protests to the contrary. Developments, especially since 2008 and around the global financial crisis, have also tended to encourage the perception of rivalry and competition on a number of fronts and issue domains. Economics and trade, development, strategic and military, the maritime realm, regional and global institutions, on all these fronts, China's occupying a larger presence. Another way to characterize this competitive dynamic is to say that China's perceived, uh, and we can debate this of course, but China's perceived as challenging areas and relationships that the United States has dominated since the end of World War II. This is new territory for the United States. Uh, China represents for the United States a comprehensive challenge that few other states have. At various points in time, we have seen in other states rivals. Uh, but if we consider those, the, uh, who have been those other states, we also see that China is notably different. Uh, we can, we've at various times looked at Japan as a rival. We can talk about Germany. We can also talk about Russia. But each of those, again, are less comprehensive in terms of the potential challenge they represent than China does. States like Japan and Germany, close allies of the United States during, Cold War, well, during the Cold War, well integrated into U.S. relations and institutions, uh, militarily, economically, and institutionally. Russia um, uh, may be a rival, but doesn't have the same economic presence uh, that China does. And so China is different, um, a different kind of ch challenge uh, uh, compared to those other states, and hence, um, the increasing perception, at least, in terms of rivalry and competition that has increasingly defined this relationship. 
These trend lines have also shifted debates um, about China in the United States, and perhaps especially in the Republican Party. Uh, historically, we think about China policy between Democrats and Republicans where Democrats tended to be more critical of China because of trade issues, because of human rights issues. Republicans were much more pro-engagement, pro-strategic engagement, economically as well as strategically. Um, but as we saw from this last election cycle, everything's all messed up. Right? Everything's all messed up. The same patterns don't hold anymore because the domestic situation has shifted. The domestic context has changed. Where the Republican Party has previously been reliably pro-trade, pro-engagement, and pro-partnership, today that position is competing hard against those in the Republican Party who see China as a threat to U.S. Uh, interests and position. Again, we saw these tensions already in the last Republican administration of George W. Bush and we, uh, in terms of the divisions within the Republican Party. We saw divisions between those who tended to emphasize the imperatives of strategic competition and those who emphasized the challenge posed to U.S. primacy, opposed by uh, U.S. military modernization and capability on one hand and those that emphasized cooperation on the other and engagement on the other. The Trump team is also putting on full display some other party divisions on China, notably between more traditional economic Republicans, for example, the Goldman Sachs branch of the Trump administration, and the newly empowered economic nationalists, um, who are more protectionists and more isolationists. These newly empowered economic nationalists are also having an effect on the strategic debate as we've seen in the administration's, again, criticisms of partners and allies. And that, too, has become another new fault line within the Republican Party in terms of how we approach our allies and partners. Uh, and here I have just kind of a, a depiction of, of, of various policy groups that scholars have identified as shaping a U.S. policy, and, and the main, and, and also uh, on the corner there, um, uh, uh, um, a, a chart displaying some of the differences between Republicans and Democrats. And as you'll see, Republicans are more critical of China uh, compared to Democrats in that lower chart. And in this upper chart, the main takeaway here is that U.S. foreign policy and U.S. China policy used to be much more of an elite exercise. And today, in our new environment, our new geopolitical and domestic environment, there are more groups that are also uh, affecting uh, the shape and course of China policy going forward. Perhaps nowhere uh, are these debates being watched as carefully as in East and Southeast Asia. East and Southeast Asia is where the US finds some of its closest allies and closest partners. Uh, where the U.S. has enjoyed strategic and economic advantage in much of the region uh, through what has been our unrivaled uh, military capability, our extensive strategic partnerships since the start of the Cold War, and our extensive economic relations with various states in the region. Um, East and Southeast Asia, where China, by virtue of geographic proximity, uh, find security challenges much more immediate to it compared to the United States. Uh, East and Southeast Asia, where many see potential flashpoints. Um, uh, uh, and East and Southeast Asia, where for the first time, China's developing military capabilities that significantly improve its ability to defend its interests beyond its immediate borders. In so doing, U.S. strategists uh, characterized China's activities as a challenge to traditional U.S. air and sea superiority in the Western Pacific. And that is a status that, again, the United States has enjoyed since the end of World War II. For many U.S. strategists, then, U.S. interests have been increasingly been defined, U.S. interests as it regards China in East Asia, have increasingly been defined in terms of U.S. primacy. Uh, one influential Republican advisor goes so far as to say, quote, primacy remains the central and consistent unifying theme for U.S. strategy in Asia going forward. Over the last decade especially, uh, concerns about China's military modernization have come to focus on 
on China's maritime uh, actions, especially in the South China Sea. These actions no doubt give U.S. military strategists pause. But if the, US and China, if the U.S. and China are to move East Asia to a more stable place, then each side also is going to have to recognize the concerns of the other. The U.S. may worry that China's growing military capacities and maritime projections will someday deny U.S. strategic access and mobility. But China worries much the same. And it's worth noting again that these are areas geographically close to China. Uh, China faces restricted access, for example, uh, to the Pacific to the, uh, as well as the Indian Oceans. Put another way, both the U.S. and China are worried more or less about the same thing. Right? The U.S. is worried about access denial. Right? And as you can see here, uh, the red, the red are, are, um, are developments, uh, jurisdictional and island building activity on the part of China. But as you'll also see there, China is not the only state that's also been carrying out such activities, though there is no doubt that China has been the most extensive and also the, the fastest in doing so. Um, but, it, but again, um, both are worried about the same thing. The U.S. is worried about access denial, but so is China and with a greater sense of uh, its existential threat because of the proximity to it. And China, of course, unlike the United States, as you can see from this map, also lacks strategically important and durable allies. It's also in East and Southeast Asia where other states, which have extensive relations with both the US and China, also have somewhat different concerns compared to the United States and China. The, the, the instabilities uh, in U.S.-China relations, the, the, the potential for heightened and intensified competition between, US -China, uh, between the United States and China is a growing source of concern amongst various uh, uh, partners uh, and states in East and Southeast Asia. So again, where we might have Washington and China concerned about such things as freedom of navigation, access denial. In the case of the United States, also worried about this uh, entrapment by allies, you know, drawing us into something that maybe we don't want to get involved in. Um, uh, those in Southeast Asia, the other claimants, for example, uh, in the South China Sea, as well as uh, in other interested states in Southeast Asia, a worry that U.S.-China competition will overwhelm uh, Southeast Asian interests. They have extensive interests with both states. Uh, that, uh, that it will uh, undermine strategic and economic interests. Um, uh, they worry about U.S. commitments still. They worry also that, that U.S. actions and China actions uh, towards one another will prove very destabilizing for all of them and with them being the main casualties. So again, a range of concerns here in terms of East Asia uh, and, and what, ha uh, what is emerging to, uh, to be some uh, pretty uh, concerning uh, competitive dynamics, um, especially over the last uh, decade. For these states in particular, China's growth is also having an effect in a multitude of ways. And that is going to also bear then on U.S. interests and U.S. policies as we go forward. For these states, China's growth is having an effect strategically, economically, demographically, as well as societally. If the biggest challenge facing the US in Asia is how to respond to China's growing influence, a related challenge is how to respond to changing East, in, changing East Asian dynamics, changing intra-East Asian dynamics in the context of China's rise. Practically every report written last year on U.S.-China policy highlighted the need to work with Asian partners on the part of the United States. Yet attention to Asia uh, as part of U.S.-China policy also comes with challenges. For one, there's danger of making U.S.-Asia policy simply a function of China policy. This has been a long-running complaint and vulnerability of U.S.-Asia policy. Uh, for another, it also draws attention to complex linkages between East Asian economies and between the economics and the conventionally strategic. For example, President Trump's 
threat to impose a 45% tariff on China, threatens not just China, but also other East Asian economies, which are all connected by extensive global supply chains and production networks. Transnational production has grown tremendously over the past quarter century. Uh, products and components are not made just in one country any, anymore, right? They're made in a variety of countries. And that means any trade actions against one country is likely to affect not just that one country, but also the others that are also part of that network and supply chain. And again, perhaps nowhere is that more true than in East and Southeast Asia. Or put another way, such tariffs would also hurt the very states that most strategists believe to be critical U.S. partners in terms of U.S. interests in East and Southeast Asia. Moreover, American consumers too, I think, would soon find out that such a policy also hits our pocketbooks as well. Uh, the, East, the East and Southeast Asian context also serves to illustrate the importance of economics in other respects. This is a region where economics can matter as much and in some cases even more than the conventional strategic issues that tend to hog the, de de the headlines. The hot spots that have historically plagued US-China relations, North Korea, Taiwan, and again most recently maritime disputes are all being affected by the region's economics. In East and Southeast Asia, questions about US commitment and US leadership come at a time when China's capacities and capacity to influence is not just growing, but when China is also being more proactive in initiating and shaping relations and frameworks of it around it. Part, much of this is domestically driven on China's part. It needs to sustain existing rates of growth right, for its own political stability, own domestic stability. But nevertheless, whatever the cause, what we are seeing in, in, in Asia currently is a more uh, a proactive China in terms of putting forth uh, various initiatives to shape uh, dynamics and relations around it. One example, just to give, uh, just to, to give a, a few examples, one example is China's initiative in creating a China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which officially went into operation last year. Uh, other examples uh, can be found in projects associated with what is now known as China's One Belt, One Road initiatives. These are initiatives that functionally have made infrastructure development, <coughs> infrastructure development their priorities. Belt and Road is about building highways, railways, uh, and waterways that can connect and link different parts of the globe to get, uh, different parts of the globe. The AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, is an infrastructure bank. There are other financial institutions that also fund infrastructure. Um, but the AIB uh, is, is devoted exclusively to infrastructure development as its, as its mandate. And these initiatives respond to what the Asian Development Bank um, most recently estimated to be $1.7 trillion. $1.7 trillion in annual infrastructure need, um, which is also more than double what the ADB estimated in 2009. Um, this is, and only a very small percentage of that is being met by existing sources. President Xi Jinping has said that he welcomes U.S. participation in these initiatives in both the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank as well as Belt and Road. In fact, he most recently said this in his meeting with President Trump last week. Um, uh, but U.S. participation also seems questionable or perhaps unlikely given the America First agenda that this administration has professed. It is also worth noting that under the current proposed budget uh, that President Trump has put forth, that it would cut funding to existing multilateral development banks, like the World Bank, which would be trimmed by these multilateral uh, development banks, would be trimmed by $650 million over three years. Not only does that suggest U.S. disinterest in contributing to these banks and projects that Asia sees, many Asian states see to be important uh, 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 to their economic stability going forward, but such cuts, of course, also then increase the importance of China's initiatives to those other states and partners. Now, again, I want to underscore that there are many, many questions about China's economy, many, many questions about the initiatives in terms of its ability to implement 
uh, in, uh, uh, these various policies. Um, and to say, uh, so to say that China's influence and initiative is growing is not to say that these things are going to go off without a hitch or without resistance or complications, nor is it to say that the United States is not with, with uh, considerable economic uh, influence in East and, uh, East and Southeast Asia. Um, rather, my point here is simply to offer some additional context and considerations that also bear on U.S.-China policy and the complexities of U.S.-China policy, especially in East and Southeast Asia. Again, the challenges um, of U.S.-China policy are reflective, I think, of the moment that we find ourselves in. At minimum, the questions raised about, uh, about U.S. ability to manage this China relationship the questions raised about how it will work with its allies and partners come at a time when we are also expecting China to have a larger presence on regional and global stages, even with the constraints and caveats that I've highlighted. One scholar from South Korea's prestigious Yonsei University summarized four factors uh, that will assume greater prominence uh, in future U.S.-China relations. The first, he argues, that China's growing hard power capabilities, even with lower economic growth projections, uh, are likely to increasingly constrain U.S. policies in Asia. Two, there are ri uh, rising opportunity costs for the United States in terms of global and regional credibility, given what he characterizes to be President Trump's erratic leadership style and, and what some is, uh, in his administration have, have proudly proclaimed to be the man-man uh, approach uh, to keep them all guessing. Right? Three, uh, the third factor bearing uh, on, on the future of U.S.-China relations in Asia, repercussions for critical security alliances throughout the Asia-Pacific uh, 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 if we don't see the administration put forth a more comprehensive uh, 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 a strategy and policy accounting for the complexity uh, that we find in East Asia in terms of China's role there. And, and then fourth, what may be a significantly weakened U.S. economic posture in Asia, just as China assumes a more assertive role in trade and economic integration. As one report, as one other report uh, concluded, in Asia, how the U.S. manages its China relationship is increasingly the litmus test for those in East and Southeast Asia. It is increased, how we manage the U.S.-China relationship is increasingly the litmus test in terms of how they view the reliability and soundness of U.S. policies going forward. Um, President Trump and President Xi Jinping, as many of you know, uh, met last week just last week, and by most accounts, this was a successful meeting. Uh, I can quote uh, President Trump. Uh, I don't know Putin, uh, but I do know this gentleman. Um, I've spent a lot of time with him over the last two, two days, and he is the president of China. Uh, they're, they're not currency manipulators. Uh, the relationship developed by President Xi and myself, I think, is outstanding. Right? So by all accounts, it would appear that this is a relatively successful meeting. Uh, the two leaders apparently came, uh, left apparently having come to greater understanding uh, on, on a number of key issues, as well as an agenda that assured each side about their most basic concerns. President Trump uh, came away with what he understood um, to be the difficulties of, Ch of China's position on Korea, right? Um, and he also came away with promises uh, by China to take steps uh, to alleviate the trade imbalance. And here, you know, again, multiple tweets um, <laughs> showing some before and afters. Um, uh, but, in, but in any case, we see some notable changes and shifts as a result of last week's meeting. Okay, at least professed by tweet. Okay, uh, uh, and then China, of course, came away with something as well. And China came away with a, re a sense of reduced uh, threat in terms of a trade war, of a potential trade war. As many note, both leaders, both leaders are under strong pressures to perform well. 
especially in the face of a more complicated domestic policymaking environment. I've already mentioned some of the shifts and changes in the United States, and especially in terms of the Republican Party in, in particular. Um, but China also faces a more complex domestic environment um, uh, that also can complicate how it works and deals with and approaches the United States. In China, we have elites and leaders that are seeking to reaffirm and bolster their legitimacy at a time when economic growth is slowing, when income disparities are growing, when there are worries about growing inflation, when it's not as clear of why the Communist Party should be leading uh, this mixed economy state. Uh, for President Xi Jinping in 20, 2017, this year, 2017 also involves heightened stakes, heightened stakes with personnel and leadership exchanges uh, expected, that, uh, leadership changes uh, expected this fall in China. Uh, in the fall, the Chinese Party Congress will meet. This is a meeting that takes place only twice every 10 years. In China's case, the stakes involve an ongoing leadership transition in China's top committee. Under China's retirement rules, a five of the seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee, uh, China's top leadership, may retire under those current rules. Under those rules, only two President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang will be the only two leaders remaining on that committee. The rest will be replaced under current retirement rules. And so that, of course, leads to all sorts of jockeying for position. Uh, uh, it is a high profile process as various leaders try to get their supporters and their backers in these key positions. So President Xi has lots at stake this year coming in. Uh, in terms of how he's able to manage the U.S. relationship. Certainly, as, as China observers pointed out, he would have been highly embarrassed and humiliated had, uh, given the fact that this trip to the United States last week was carefully planned, uh, so he would have been uh, embarrassed and certainly undercut had that meeting not gone well. So again, in both cases, we have a more complicated domestic policy environment. And in China's case, we have a particularly uh, a difficult year in 2017, or at least a high stakes year in 2017, given the, the changes that are expected uh, later this year in terms of the top leadership. Uh, again, he would want to demonstrate his stature as a statesman meeting with the United States president. Um, who again has criticized China uh, uh, along the tra campaign trail, and he was able to get that, right? To demonstrate uh, his stature as a statesman. Among the deliverables, President Trump and Xi Jinping agreed to a new negotiation framework that would be directly overseen by the two presidents. Uh, it would bring together cabinet members uh, for discussion on security, uh, the economy, law enforcement, cybersecurity, cultural issues, among others. Um, also, uh, the 100 day plan, someone referred to, this is not my term, somebody referred to it as the tweetable deliverables. Um, uh, but US President uh, Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping have also agreed to a new 100 day plan for, tr for, uh, for a trade agenda aimed at boosting uh, US exports and reducing the US uh, trade deficit with China. Again, much remains unknown. Okay? And a lot of the details, as you can see here, remain to be outlined. Um, uh, but the meeting does appear to have created a starting point for cooperation and improved relations, but of course much will depend on the details uh, as we go forward. The meeting does serve to illustrate, I think, um, you know, an important dynamic um, that, I've, uh, that I've already mentioned. And, and that is that as much as this relationship may be uh, uh, increasingly characterized by dynamics uh, and aspects of competition and rivalry, it is also, of course, very much one of economic interdependence. And that interdependence can be cause for conflict as well, and tension, as we saw, for example, from the criticisms um, uh, uh, by President Trump and others on the campaign trail. But they can also create strong pressures to basically work it out. 
Um, again, um, as, as scholars and as, a, as, a, as one China, uh, very prominent China um, uh, political scientist put it, we live in a world today where the, US scale, where the scale of economic interdependence worldwide and between the United States and China is unprecedented. And so while we may worry about how China's economic growth and economic policies are detracting from American prosperity and jobs, American growth uh, is also very much tied to China. And China um, is a major market for US products from machinery to agriculture and services. Um, and of course, China itself finds itself hugely dependent also uh, on, US, on the United States, on US allies and US partners. Um, which accounted for roughly two-fifths of China's overall trade, uh, or about a fifth of its gross domestic product, and one-third of the official foreign direct investment flowing into China. So again, this is, a, this is a relationship of complicated mutual economic interdependence. Uh, similarly, China may hold large amounts of American debt, but that means that it also has a very strong interest in a stable and strong U.S. economy. Right. Um, so um, uh, to, uh, one, um, one uh, uh, commentator um, uh, put it this way, and I'll quote him. He says, the world's biggest and second biggest economies uh, in, the, in, uh, in the world are like a married couple. Uh, so they're like a married couple that complain about each other constantly, uh, yet can't even contemplate a divorce. <laughs> so to conclude, the U.S.-China relationship has been called the essential relationship. Um, and though it may be characterized by increasing aspects of rivalry, it is also characterized by an intricate mix of strategic and economic competition and interdependence, as well as intersecting bilateral and regional relations. Again, lots of concerns um, about, there are lots of concerns about the uh, potential for deterioration of relations. But again, few, men, uh, few also expect that the relationship is, complete, is going to completely blow up because of these other mitigating factors in terms of the strong interests that also take us together, uh, bring us together. Um, uh, um, I mean, I'm not. I'm sure there are. There's, uh, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but to quote Xi Jinping, we have a thousand reasons to get China-U.S. relations right, and not one reason to spoil the China-U.S. relationship. To be sure, there are many reasons uh, to get the China-U.S. relationship right, but there are also many reasons and many possibilities in terms of how it might also go wrong. Um, the takeaways for U.S. policy, um, some that, that I might uh, highlight here. I think that the fundamental challenge for the United States as regards China policy is how to navigate these two competing pressures uh, that I've highlighted. Um, how to navigate the inclination, right, the inclination to compete in response to the rise of China uh, in terms of making primacy our primary policy and criteria. Um, and, the strong, and, and, on the, and then on the other hand, the strong pressures for cooperation as a result of our common interdependence. Again, there are fears that um, the, the rivalry and competition aspects of it will basically uh, uh, unravel or undermine all those other extensive areas of interest that would benefit from U.S.-China cooperation. I think, as I've suggested, the fundamental danger, I think, to U.S. interests is making U.S. primacy the policy, right? Um, interests, thinking about what our primary interests are in Asia should be the guiding uh, approach, um, uh, not U.S. primacy per se. Um, it's difficult, a struggle for primacy is an expensive game, right? The struggle for primacy is an expensive game. Um, it's a zero-sum strategy in which there's always going to be a loser. Right? Um, and it's hugely expensive for the, for the two protagonists, and it's hugely expensive for those around it. And security and stability are unlikely to be the beneficiaries. Um, and, so, uh, and so going forward, um, uh, uh, the US-China policy faces a number of challenges, um, thinking about how to balance these competing pressures. The other pressure, I think, as I've suggested, is also to think more comprehensively about U.S. policy, not just in terms of military terms, but also in terms of economic diplomacy, institutional diplomacy, multilateral diplomacy. 
If you look at the U.S. budget that was proposed by President Trump, it's very clear where that strategy is going to be. It will be military, right? And in Asia, that will be an unsuccessful, ineffective policy. Right? So I'll leave it at that. Um, and um, I think, um, there we go. <laughs>